Okay, so welcome back to the afternoon session. We now have two single talks uh, about the history of physics. And we'd like to start with Ricardo Karam from the University of Copenhagen. Uh, and he will talk about the Schrödinger struggles with the complex wave function. So. Yes. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Um, first of all, thanks to the organizers for uh, accepting this submission. It's, by the time I saw the title History for Physics, I thought this is the conference I need to go because yeah, it's very nice to meet people and discuss about how important history is for physics. Uh, as you can see, I'm located at the Department of Science Education, so my main concern is uh, with physics education and how can we use history in physics education with the training, including the training of future physicists. So, of course, it is related to the physics as a research field as well. Uh, it is a pleasure and an honor to be in Vienna and talk about Schrödinger, so that was also quite a nice thing. Uh, let me start by giving you a little bit of a background and motivation for that so that you can know what to expect and understand a little bit the kinds of uh, things um, that motivated me to think about these things. I would say that my main motivation or you know, what drives my research, what I'm constantly thinking about, is uh, the educational implications of the relationship between physics and mathematics. What makes it uh, difficult for students? How can we improve teaching? Uh, concerning this intrinsic mathematical aspect of physics, uh, how challenging it is and, and everything. So uh, what led me to history is really trying to understand better this relationship and how can we use uh, original sources and everything uh, to improve teaching. Uh, one episode, of course, I mean, talking about mathematics and physics is just too general to be productive at all, so we need to pick some episodes and to make sense of that particular, um, or the kind of relationship in a particular instance. I've been thinking for a while about the use of complex numbers, complex functions in physics. It's an interesting case because complex numbers emerged in mathematics. In Italy, they were not related to physics, and after a while, they become quite useful for physics, and it was a process that uh, Salomon Bochner once called the complexification of physics. So it's, it is within this context that you inevitably get to the question of, okay, complex numbers, complex functions in quantum mechanics, and um, uh, the common view is that, well, whereas complex numbers are quite useful calculation tools in classical physics, but they they make calculations easier, but they are not necessarily indispensable or, or, or essential. The situation seems to be different in, in quantum mechanics. They are indispensable somehow. So that, that led to, to this kind of uh, reasoning. Why exactly and especially how can we then uh, justify this to students? So now we get closer and closer to the question, okay, but why, why is the wave function complex and how important is that kind of question, for example, when a student is encountering this for the first time. Uh, David Kaiser mentioned that in Schiff's book, the Schrodinger equation appears in page 21, and I would say by far the most used textbook uh, at universities uh, nowadays in quantum mechanics, Griffiths, that is in page one, right? So the time-dependent Schrodinger equation appears in page one, you already might wonder, what is this I here doing here? It's a bit strange, a fundamental equation that's supposed to describe things in the real world, and there's an I there. In principle, it's already something strange. But, I mean, in page two, you say, but that's not a problem, because uh, when you th talk about things that you can actually measure, it's probability densities, you're talking about the absolute square of this, so it doesn't matter that it's complex, because, I mean, in, you get real numbers in the end, so that's not a problem. Eh? Let's, let's move on. So there is an issue. I can completely understand the reasons why, well, let's give what is consensus and move on. So I'm not kind of saying that this doesn't do a purpose, but I'm just wondering from the point of view of a student, seeing that for the first time, never saw before something where these complex entities play such an essential role, 
it might be something like, okay, how come, what, why, and everything. So, uh, so it, the question was, okay, was that so natural to Schrodinger? I mean, how Schrodinger perceived this? So that was kind of what got me uh, interested in this. And then it's fairly easy to find a struggle, so to speak, uh, that Schrodinger, and he's quite explicit about that. Um, and this is the topic I'm going to guide you through four, in four instances of this process of initial struggles he had with the acceptance of a complex wave function. So, for example, he clearly states that in a letter to Lawrence in June 6, what is unpleasant here and indeed directly to be objected to is the use of complex numbers. Psi is fundamentally a real function. It's quite easy actually to find these kind of things in the beginning, especially that 26 and, and yeah, especially 1926, we do find this. So here's the, uh, here are the instances, the episodes that uh, I want to present you and that, that show that some of Schrodinger's struggles with a complex psi. The first one is a, a classic and uh, I, would, I would argue even usable for, uh, for physics teaching when we get there. So in a, in a very short communication, short paper called From, from Micro to Macro Mechanics, uh, we can clearly see that he's after a physical interpretation only of the real part of his psi. And that's, that's quite explicit, and uh, we'll go to that in the first part of the talk. Uh, the second one is also interesting and easy. In the very beginning of his fourth communication, um, where it is for the first time he's presenting the time-dependent equation, he, seems, he does something strange, which seems to somehow avoid the explicit appearance of this imaginary unit in the equation. There are deeper reasons for that. One could say, well, why, why isn't he uh, writing the equation with the, this explicit I uh, as we know today? Uh, these deep reasons are related to an idea that you might be able to find a, a unique relationship between the real and the imaginary parts of the complex wave function so that in a way it is also some kind of uh, calculational tool, but the essence, the physical essence would be, for example, in the real part. We will go a little bit into that, and that was, uh, uh, I found a, a piece of a notebook where he's quite explicit about what he's doing. He does communicate the results to Lawrence in this letter, but here he, in the notebooks, he's, he's, he's like really going through a rather apparently basic uh, step of separating the real and the imaginary parts of the wave function and trying to get to some kind of relationship between them. And then in some sense, we find a year later indications where somehow accepts and even justifies that the wave count, uh, function needs to be complex. Uh, we'll go through in, in the last part, uh, there's a series of lectures he gives in March 1928 called Four Lectures on Quantum Mechanics. There he's very explicit, and he justifies uh, both due to the need to preserve the Bohr frequency relation, and in an interesting way, he says, he comes up with a, an analogy with Maxwell's equation. So this is, let's hope we go through this. Uh, uh, that's the plan. So the first slide is this, uh, uh, is his, uh, uh, interpretation of, of the real part, and this is a very short paper. He starts by presenting the solution of the harmonic oscillator, and then already by the time he presents the solution, he already puts a footnote there. I means the square root of minus one. On the right-hand side, the real part is to be taken as usual. Of course, we're dealing with waves. We write this complex exponentials, but this is just a uh, uh, a very handy mathematical tool, physical meaning is in the real part. So that's quite clear. And he even plots for several values of n the form of these um, functions here. And then he goes on and considers what if we have a group of these uh, many vibrations and he will show how they can then come to represent this particle. So, he writes psi as a sum of n to infinity, so he's adding all these proper functions. 
Um, and he gets to this, there's some mathematical theorems that he gets from Hilbert and Courant always, and then he gets to this expression here, which there's still the I there, and then he again said, okay, but now we take as provided for the real part of the right-hand side, and then he gets to this expression. You see that there's no I here anymore because this is the real part of this expression here. And then he, he, he's commenting on what, does, what, what it happens with this function in this behavior and there and there. And then he makes this drawing here, which kind of you know, uh, looks like a, a, a compact uh, wave packet. And he claims our wave group always remains compact and does not spread out into larger regions as time goes on, as we were accustomed to make it to do, for example, in optics. And then he ends the paper with a bold, but ends up to be a false prediction. We can definitely foresee that in a similar way, wave groups can be constructed, which move around highly quantized Kepler ellipses and are the representation by wave mechanics of the hydrogen electron. That turns out not to be the case. This is actually the only case where that happens, but it shows his uh, wish or you know, how, how he was normally dealing with a wave formalism and how you would expect to represent a particle with this wave mechanics. I would just like to say this is two or three pages. We normally all teach the harmonic oscillator to first year students or the first contact. I think it wouldn't be too demanding to just glance at this paper and have an idea of what Schrodinger was expecting from that. But that's a kind of an opinion or maybe a suggestion. When we look at the fourth communication where he presents his time-dependent equation, it does something apparently strange. So he starts from what he calls the amplitude equation or the time-independent equation, and then the goal is to eliminate this energy parameter, makes it more general, not depending on a particular energy parameter, and also uh, involving how side changes uh, varies with time. Then he assumes, okay, psi is some kind of frequency or periodicity in this function. And then from here, he actually derives it twice with respect to time. And then he gets this relationship. And in order to substitute this here and get rid of E, he somehow has to square this equation. And he gets to this rather uh, complicated looking uh, equation and he's like, but then he's emphasizing this is the uniform general wave equation. So I would say Schrodinger in his fourth communication is claiming that this is the time dependent Schrodinger equation. Uh, it is no longer of the simple type that we had before, but it is of the fourth order. I mean, you have second order in time, you have fourth order in space here. It is similar to some in elasticity and in, vi in vibrating plate. It's quite instructive to read the last paragraph of his fourth communication because he is not satisfied with the state of, of, of the theory and he, and he manifests that. He says, he ends the paper saying, meanwhile, there is no doubt a certain crudeness in the use of a complex wave function. If it were unavoidable in principle and not merely a facilitation of the calculation, this would mean that there are actually two wave functions, say the real and imaginary part, which must be used together in order to obtain information on the state of the system. This seems unacceptable. So he, he, he's not satisfied when you read the, the last paragraph. It's like, the, we, yeah, he, he, well. And then it was, um, it, he mentions, this, this part he does mention in, in the, law, the letter to Lawrence, but not the calculations. And then uh, it was kind of a, it was by luck. I was glancing the, the, the notebooks. There's so many, and okay, you, you do have uh, um, you, you do have some uh, say some some references to which topics to look at. But I wasn't actually really expecting. I don't know how how clear this can be here. But this page is quite interesting, where he's explicitly expressing uh, his um, yeah his, his struggle and what what is he trying to do here and. Uh, he would like to, take, uh, to thank my colleague and friend, Christian Neus, to help me decipher this. <laughs> but 
actually, in the beginning, one can read, was bedeutet überhaupt? What does it mean, psi times psi bar? And then it's something like, lässt sich das ohne Randziehung des Komplexen physikalisch fassen? Can we, actually, can we interpret this without this complex uh, uh, structure and nature physically? That's, so that he writes there in the beginning. And then he does something, I'll try to go through this. So actually the continuation of that citation in the last part of the fourth communication is something like, that seems un unacceptable or it's not, it's not satisfied. The state should be given by a real function and its time derivative. And that's what he's trying to do here, I'll just give you an idea. It's actually quite simple. So he writes the psi as this expansion of, of proper functions, and then he considers that both C and of course this one, it has both a real and an imaginary part. This is what is written here. So he's separating the real and the imaginary part, and that enables him to explicitly write psi as some psi r plus i times psi i. So the real part plus an, an imaginary part, quite explicitly. It's just a bit difficult to see here because he's using kind of a capital psi for the real part and the normal lowercase psi for so. He's better, but he's talking about the real and the imaginary part. And then, well, he writes his uh, equations just with a differential operator, and he gets to this relationship here, which is here. And we can see that his goal is somehow he's expressing the time derivative of, of psi as a function of the real part and the derivative of the real part. So that's kind of his initial goal. And, in the end, he shows that, well, one, get, one gets this equation, uh, at least for the conservative uh, uh, case, um, which essentially, so to speak, is just about uh, the real part. So you can still have the physical uh, interpretation there. Um, then when we look at one year later, after 26 and 27, for example, he writes, uh, a paper on the exchange of energy according to wave mechanics, you don't read that uh, struggle or any kind of problem anymore. The first equation in the paper is this one, and he just adds a footnote. The wave function must be essentially complex. There's no, uh, thanks. Um, and then there are these four lectures on wave mechanics, which I, think they are a pedagogical masterpiece. They are didactical, um, really I think it was an attempt to present his theory and his main ideas to some kind of general audience of, of, of students, for example, as if he were an undergraduate course or something. So in his four lectures, he goes back to the problem of removing the energy parameter from the amplitude equation, and he says this is easily done pretty much uh, you derive psi with respect to time once, you get your E, you substitute here, you get the equation there. So there's no, there's no problem with a complex wave function or there are no discussion about what does the real part mean and the imaginary part mean. Um, but then he still uh, consciously, explicitly, refers to this idea of why it has to be complex. So he's actually presenting some argument for that rather explicitly. This is still from the four lectures. He said, now return to the general vibration function, which is just the expansion of psi in proper functions. Uh, we put the question, is it possible to ascribe a definite physical meaning to the quantity psi in such a way that the emission of light with frequencies nu k k prime is nu k minus nu k prime becomes intelligible? So here's, here's the situation, he, here's a, a concrete problem. Uh, he says, yes, it is, but strange to say, only if we make use of the complex psi function as it stands, instead of its real part as we are accustomed to do in ordinary vibration problems. So here, he's a little bit more explicit and he's saying, why is it that we, we actually need, so in a way he says, well, if we want to preserve this relation, we need a complex uh, function. And the hypothesis that he already presented before 
is the following. That's again from the four lectures. The square of the absolute value of psi is proportional to an electric density, which causes emission of light according to the laws of ordinary dynamics. So if you have psi times the conjugate of psi, you can kind of see, you get a term here, which is frequency term, which is exactly the, the difference between two frequencies. So in a way, you kind of have an idea, all right, if you want a, a frequency which is originated from the difference between two frequencies, this kind of uh, mathematical structure gives you. Uh, and then the last is, which I also find quite interesting, he himself in the four lectures then argues, well, but if the physical meaning is on psi, psi bar, why not replace the wave equation by an equation which describes the behavior of psi, psi bar directly, right? This is what is physically meaningful, accessible. Why not do that? And then here's his reflection or comment. He refers to Maxwell's equations, and then he says, Maxwell's equations describe the behavior of electromagnetic vectors. But these are not really accessible to observation. The only things that are observable are the ponderative forces, or if you please, the energy, since the forces are caused by virtual energy. But all these quantities, energy, Maxwellian stresses, they are quadratic functions of the field vectors. Therefore, we might desire to replace Maxwell's equations by others that determine the observable quadratic functions of the field vectors directly. But everyone will agree that this would, at all events, mean an immense complication and that it would not really be possible to do without Maxwell's equations. So in a way, he's saying this is formally similar to what Maxwell's equations do. You have the quadratic functions, which are the ones that you observe, but you wouldn't have, uh, you wouldn't wish to have these equations. Everyone would agree that Maxwell's equations is better, so it's pretty okay to have uh, the equations initially in the, the complex uh, form. So this is uh, kind of an outline of a sketch of a process of initial struggle, because formally he was, he was not only uh, committed to this wave uh, picture of the world, but naturally to the formalism, and that's how wave formalism used to uh, think and use complex numbers with, but somehow the process, uh, in, in somehow in, in one year, is a little bit uh, accepting and justifying uh, the use or the need for this complex wave function. That was it, thanks for your attention. So thank you very, very much for the interesting talk. Yeah. We now have five minutes for questions. So. I enjoyed this very much. Thanks, Rick. Um, it reminded me that, that Bohr was also rather skeptical about the introduction of I. And I remember a passage somewhere. I could dig it up. I, can't, I, I don't have it at the top of my head, but I could dig it up for you where in some later paper, Bohr um, laments the necessary introduction of the symbolic, he would use phrases like this, this the, the symbolic procedure of introducing the imaginary number for the purpose of simplifying the equations. So he, he seems to similarly have the same mindset that one could write the equations of quantum mechanics without the I, but then they would be uh, very complex and ugly. And it was only the introduction of the I that allowed one to see the simplicity of just going straight from Hamilton's equations down to, to um, Heisenberg dynamics, mm -hmm. I think. So um, I, 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 there must have been an immense struggle in many people. In, in, in their, this must have been a kind of cognitive dissonance, not only for Schrodinger, but there's also evidence of Bohr and then maybe everyone else. Mm -hmm. Why? Why this I? Thanks. I'll, I'll be very interested in, in looking at that. I've been looking at some, how, how they would, for example, express um, a Fourier expansion of, of, of something. Just, you know, how do you write the expansion? And, for example, I, I saw that when Bohr writes, and he's talking, like, I think it's 1918 or something, in the correspondence principle, some of them, he writes 
as an expansion of, of cosines. And, and when Heisenberg comes, and also in his, his work, previous work in, in optics with commas and everything, it's clearly uh, already with the complex exponential. So it's, it's interesting at that time to see, okay, this is, is it, 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 is it just a different mathematical convenience? Or, or when is it that it then it's physically essential somehow? I, I would love to, if if you know if you dig it, I would love to to look at that. <laughs> Thanks. Okay. Are there any other questions? Oh, yeah. Thank you very much. Um, I'm interested in um, the paper where you read the quote that you put on the acceptance slide. Where did you Where did he? Okay. In the in the uh, yeah. that, that, this is this is not a paper. This is a kind of this is a series of lectures. The four lectures on wave mechanics. It's very easily to find online. So it's called yeah. It's really much called like this. Four lectures on wave mechanics. Uh, Schrödinger gave in March 1928 in in London, and to me it's. Uh, it's, it's a didactical masterpiece, at least at the time, it's a very well-structured presentation of, of his ideas and, and thoughts. Okay, thanks. Yeah. Hi, Ricardo, thank you for, thank very you. much for the lecture. Um, as a pedagogical uh, strategy, I think it's very fascinating, but what is the expected reaction of the grad students to this kind of uh, pedagogical strategies? They're, did you go any further in this um, evaluation? No, not yet. Thank you. Um, yeah, it's um, this. This what I mentioned is really like I don't know a guess or a, an invitation. You know, I think I think it's fair to say that uh, yeah, this this first wondering about why why do I have now this complex thing that that would kind of be a, kind of be a natural you no know, wondering at least, and so. I would think that, at least ideally, it would be nice to think about how, how can we actually give some reasons why and, and already for the introductory level. I haven't tried it uh, yet, and I know that there is a dangerous balance there, of course. Right? So in this sense, I, I would fully agree with what David Kaiser said. It, sometimes it can be, okay, this is too distractive now. It's really like, it's going. So I, I, that's, why I, that's why I think this, this paper, this short episode, is the kind of thing that I think it adds without being too distractive. And those are often difficult to find, actually. <laughs> okay, we have uh, one short remark. Then we have to move on. It's indeed the remark. Yeah. Thanks very much for, for it was very, very inspiring talk Thank you. for this, this approach to the adaptives. Now, I just wanted to, to point out that the Schrodinger's papers are above our heads. Four, four floors above you, you find the collection of Schrodinger's paper here. And most of them have been uh, digitalized and are accessible uh, through the service of our library. So for mm -hmm. people who are doing research on Schrodinger, this is a resource that has been recently yeah. acquired by the University of Vienna. And they nice. are, they are uh, accessible now. Nice. nice. <laughs> <laughs> so let's thank the speaker again. Thank you very thank much. You. <laughs>